But again, tell me, dear sir, who are most forward in excluding from public schools the sacred oracles? Solomon once thought it a dictate of wisdom to train up a child in the way he should go. But in this it appears he was completely mistaken. For we have now discovered in this age of reason that an early religious education is highly injurious, that it has a tendency to fill the mind with prejudices and prepositions, to bias it in favor of a system, and ultimately to destroy all freedom of inquiry. We have therefore wisely excluded the scriptures from our seminaries of education. Our children must not be allowed to read these sacred oracles, lest too much familiarity should breed contempt. Their young and tender minds must be left, like the sluggard's garden, overrun with noxious weeds, in order to prepare them for the good seed of the word of God. The enemy must be allowed time to sow his tares before the good husbandman be permitted to plant his wheat. In respect for the scriptures, these modern Illuminati are only one step behind the old mother church. To prevent their being abused, they have only to lock them up from the laity altogether. Speak out, my dear sir, to inform the public by what class of Christians the Bible is thus betrayed with a kiss, whether by the advocates of creeds and confessions or those latitudinarians who oppose these standards, because they cordially hate their contents. Inform the world by what class of Christians the Bible is most read, studied, and respected, whether by the friends or by, whether by the friends or enemies of the Westminster Confession and its doctrines. By what class of Christians is the plenary inspiration of the Bible denied, and the Old Testament scriptures represented as an anti antiquated almanac? Excuse me. After the confession of faith, Psalms of David, etc., the next thing to be laid aside is that code of discipline which our blessed Redeemer has established in his word. The various articles of this code will be found in different departments of the New Testament. A number of these articles we shall here exhibit in one view. Quote, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him of his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. But now I have written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but entreat him as a brother. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Then that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, etc. Unquote. Such, my dear brethren, is a specimen of that code of discipline handed down in the New Testament by our Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church. Such are the immutable laws which the Redeemer himself has established, and which you have presumed to supersede and alter. Out of your own mouth you stand condemned. For page 20 you say, quote, If the constitution and laws of the church be fixed by Christ himself, I know not how any man can take the liberty to, to, to supersede or alter them, unquote. Now, sir, you are the very man who has taken the liberty to supersede and alter the laws of Christ. For in page 23 you assure us, quote, That though the doctrines should remain as they came from heaven, yet the discipline may be varied as circumstances require, unquote. Nay, sir, you have dared to supersede the Redeemer's code of discipline by a civil code, a code which may be necessary in one age but unnecessary in another, a code which you candidly confess has no more foundation in the word of God than the hour for public worship. Thus, sir, you have laid aside, not decently, but rudely and presumptuously, the disciplinary laws of your exalted Redeemer. In the room of those laws you have set up a civil, unauthenticated, fluctuating code, from which, even to the word of God, you will not allow so much as even the privilege of appeal. Let us hear your own words. Quote, even where human standards of doctrine exist, the appeal will always be made to revelation, but in codes of discipline, the appeal must be made to the code itself. Unquote. Say now, my dear friend, let all the world judge whether you or the advocates of creeds and confessions are the most sincerely attached to the sacred oracles. With them, you candidly grant, the last appeal is to revelation. But with you the laws of Christ are a dead letter. 
They're, they are completely superseded. From your fluctuating code, there is no appeal. Is this, my dear sir, the result of all your flaming professions of respect for the scriptures? Are you the clergyman who declared himself unwilling to be measured by any other rule but the perfect one of divine revelation? Are you the reverend Presbyterian who was so much afraid of setting up any human standard, lest it might supersede the word of God, rival its splendor, or divert the attention of men from its perfection? And yet, after all, without shame or remorse, by one stroke you sweep away the whole of that divinely inspired code of disciplinary laws established by the blessed Redeemer of men? In all this, to use your own words, quote, however innocent you may presume yourself to be, you are guilty of rebellion against the person of Christ as the head of the church, unquote. The church and the world are distinct societies. The one is an enclosure, the other a common. In scripture, the church is represented by a walled city, a field, a vineyard, a garden enclosed, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. It is the will of heaven that the distinction between the church and the world should be perpetually kept up that the church's enclosure should remain forever inviolable. This distinction was established by the Almighty himself when there was only one family on the face of the earth. Cain, as unworthy of church privileges, was excommunicated by his Maker, banished from the presence of the Lord, and excluded from the fellowship of the saints. This was the first wall of partition built between the church and the world. The breaking down of this wall was the cause of the deluge. The church of God mingling with the excommunicated offspring of Cain rapidly degenerated till the earth was filled with violence and till Noah and his family accepted, all flesh were corrupted and the flood came and swept them all away. Every person knows that the Jewish church was a complete enclosure. Subjected to a code of discipline, remarkably rigorous by a middle wall of partition, she was separated from the world. If at any time she suffered her walls of discipline to be broken down, she was severely reprimanded and chastised. Her priests, if guilty in this matter, were degraded, whilst those who were faithful obtained the highest encomiums and were encouraged to persevere and to teach the people of God the difference between the holy and the profane and to cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. Relaxation of discipline was uniformly accompanied by a corresponding relaxation of morals and was always followed by an alarming visitation of providence. Under the gospel dispensation, the middle wall of partition between the Jews and Gentiles is broken down, but not that wall which separates the church from the world. In the New Testament scriptures quoted above, and a variety of others, the separating lines are distinctly drawn. Persons of heretical opinions or immoral character have no right to be recognized as Christians. We are commanded to reject them, to treat them as heathen men, and publicans, to have no company with them, that they may be ashamed. A sense of shame is a powerful principle. Its influence is incalculable. Hence we find that the laws of honor are frequently obeyed, whilst the laws of state are treated with contempt. Now if a sense of shame operates so powerfully in securing obedience to the laws of honor, falsely so called to the laws of gambling, etc., how much more powerful must it be, um, excuse me, must be its operation in securing obedience to the laws of morality, to the laws of religion, to the laws of God? By confounding all distinction between the church and the world, the operations of that powerful principle of shame are completely paralyzed and affects the most baneful and perni and affects the most baneful and pernicious produced. Such conduct, though dignified with the specious epithets of liberality and charity, I have no hesitation to pronounce alike repugnant to the laws of Christ and the soundest principles of reason and philosophy. Could a city be more completely exposed to the incursions of her enemies than by breaking down of her walls and fortifications? Could a cornfield be more effectually ruined than by breaking down of its fences? Could a vineyard be more effectually destroyed than by removing of its hedges? Quote, Why hast thou broken down her hedges, so that all they that pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Unquote. Quote, I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man, void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns. Nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Unquote. Tell me, my dear sir, could you more effectually ruin the church of God than by breaking down the walls of her discipline? How is it possible for the holy city to be trampled underfoot of the Gentiles? Is it not by admitting into the church of God the impious and immoral, the profligate and the profane, is it not by giving things that are holy to dogs? And here is a footnote. In the present enlightened age, it is becoming unfashionable to exclude the solemn ordinances any who have a desire for communion. 
no discipline, no tokens of admission, no debarring. These are only the relics of bigotry and superstition. It is left to the consciences of all whether or not they will participate. Now, in the word of God, the profane are denominated dogs and swine, animals, not the most remarkable for dissidence or modesty. Serious as the subject is, it is a scarcely it is scarcely possible to avoid smiling when we hear downy doctors gravely addressing dogs and swines, politely appealing to their consciences whether they will taste the children's bread. Surely this is a liberality surely this is liberality with a witness. I'm going to reread that sentence. Is not by giving things that are holy to dogs and casting pearls before swine? Is it not by admitting to the most solemn ordinances persons who should be treated as heathen men and publicans? When such persons are admitted, then the holy city is trampled under foot of Gentiles. It is profaned by persons who, though they may wear the name of Christians, are in reality baptized infidels. Nay, sir, when the walls of discipline are broken down, the temple of God is destroyed, and, quote, if any man destroy the temple of God, him will God destroy, unquote. Presume not, therefore, to supersede or alter the laws of your Redeemer. Dare not to substitute any civil code in the room of that system which he has established. Attempt not to legislate for the Church of Christ. Content yourself with the faithful execution of those laws which he has enacted. Allow me to address you in the language of Paul to Timothy. Quote, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality, unquote. I'm well aware that to break down the walls of discipline and to build the temple of God with wood, hay, and stubble, as well as with gold, silver, and precious stones, is a dictate of worldly wisdom. I know that the most abandoned characters are frequently the most opulent and that the faithful exercise of discipline would be attended with a prodigious reduction of numbers and dimu diminution of emoluments. For these considerations, I do not think it strange that the ministers of the gospel should reason thus, quote, If we exercise Christian discipline, our meeting houses will be immediately deserted. We shall soon find ourselves left in a small minority, stripped of all our wealth and respectability. We shall be hissed off the stages as enthusiastic bigots, the offscouring of all things and the refuse. On the contrary, by decently laying aside the discipline of the church, we shall be looked up to as gentlemen of liberal, enlightened minds, minds quite free from the prejudices and bigotry of the dark ages. We shall obtain both wealth and aggrandizement, and, have, having large congregations, we shall have it in our power to do more good." Unquote. In reply to all such reasonings, the words of the divinely inspired apostle when treating of this subject are very appropriate. Quote, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Unquote. Des <clears throat> excuse me. Decidedly hostile to everything calculated, quote, to supersede the sacred oracles, to rival their splendor, or divert the attention of mankind from their perfection, unquote. I am, etc.